this is the last message in the Set the Tone series. And it takes us to Romans chapter 12. Chapters 1 through 11 are an incredible description of the extravagant grace of God. And so when you come into chapter 12, it's our response to that grace. So Paul starts with, therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, what we've seen in those first 11 chapters, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Holy Spirit, you have been so personal and powerful among us. And we know that with you, the best is always yet to come. So set the tone in this final and permanent way because God, we, we believe in a fire that's so strong that it'll never burn out. We see that in the early church. And I pray that you teach us about sacrifice, what it is to be a living sacrifice and to experience that fire, that consuming work of God that makes us passionate and focused and full of purpose and living in that difference that you have called us to make in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. And thank you, worship team. Let's say thanks for how they led us in worship today. We're called to be a living sacrifice. Interesting words, but the description is what's so important. When we think about sacrifice, we, we think about the Old Testament and there was death involved with every sacrifice right up and pointing to Jesus who would be the ultimate and final sacrifice. So when we talk about sacrifice, it is from forgiveness, not for it. Grace is not opposed to works. It's opposed to merit. You cannot earn your salvation. You cannot work yourself to being good enough. It is by the grace of God. It is through Jesus and Jesus alone, his provision of grace through his sinless life that we can be saved. But once we are saved, and if you're saved today, you know that overwhelming gift. Now, now we work out our salvation. Now we offer ourselves, according to Romans 12, as a living sacrifice. We're talking about sacrifice on this side of the cross where it's dynamic. And as we see in a full surrender, that kind of living sacrifice, there will be the fire of God for conviction, consecration, and difference making. Hebrews 13, 5 says, Through Jesus, therefore, let us continually offer to God, say it with me, a what? A, a sacrifice of praise, the fruit of lips that openly profess his name, and do not forget to do good and to share with others, for with such sacrifices God is pleased. The writer of Hebrews is talking to people that are struggling because of intense persecution. And he's telling them, keep your eyes on Jesus. Fix your focus on him. One of the themes of Hebrews is don't drift. But he takes it up a notch and he says, and don't quit sharing your faith. A living sacrifice is to keep sharing, professing the name of Jesus. Also, it's the life that we're living. We're doing good. We're sharing with others for such sacrifices, God is pleased. It's our lips and our life. First Peter chapter two, verse five, you also like living stones are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, offering spiritual, say it with me, spiritual, acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. I want you to see once again, the importance of us understanding we are a holy priesthood that in the new covenant, since Jesus' death and resurrection, we are all raised, saved to serve, to minister. We don't use the word priest as much as we use, you're a minister. And so in 
that ministry in this priesthood of all believers, the first thing we do is like the priesthood. We worship God. We minister to God. And it's then that we can minister to others. If we don't first worship God, then we have nothing to offer. So we come and bring a sacrifice of praise. This is where we're reminded that this gathering, thank God that we're all here and I love to see you, but this is really about an audience of one and it's God Almighty. And what we have just done is we have offered worship to God because that's our first priority. The number one priority you have as a believer, we have as a church, is to worship God. And then we have something to go and offer this community where we live. So we bring a sacrifice of praise. As I heard these young adults roar about, you know, they're having lunch after church, getting together, it made me wonder if any of them were blessed to have the song in their generation of, we bring the sacrifice of into the You're so good. Now we're going to the bridge. Oh, you got it. They're wondering, what are these people doing? You know, I'm just having a flashback. Back in the day... This section over here, they they love it so much they were singing a little bit faster, and it sounded like we were doing rounds. Do y'all remember singing in rounds? (laughs) We're not going to do that today or ever. (laughs) We bring, we bring, nope. Now, I don't know if you were blessed to have that song part of your journey. I don't know if you liked it but I can tell you the theology of it is right. We bring a sacrifice of praise into the house of the Lord and we offer up to you because that's the first thing we do as believers. We worship God and then we're ready. We lift our hands, we clap our hands, we lift our voices because God is great and worthy to be praised. We are, I got to be so careful not to let this message get too long. There's so many things that need to be taught here. Let me remind us that coming to church is not a religious duty. It is an opportunity to follow through on the scripture and come together. We gather as the people of God. We are called not to forsake this gathering because we are saved and raised to the level of ministers and all of us, watch this, you are the worship team. Those up here were facilitating our opportunity as a whole church of ministers to do what is of first importance, worship God. Amen. And then, then we go and serve. And we'll get into that more in the message. So that's the teaching from Hebrews to Romans to 1 Peter that we're still offering sacrifice, but it's a living sacrifice. Romans 12 is going to break it down with even greater clarity and conviction because it lists five areas. I call them relationships that if revival is happening, these five relationships are gonna be in in right place and order. Romans 12, one says that we offer our bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. That's that first relationship I'm talking about. God first living. When the spirit of God is moving in fresh power, we are called to draw near. We are convicted about how we're doing in our relationship with God. Number two, our relationship with the world. It says, do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. So we are in this world. 
but we are not of it. And we need to pray that through every day and, and with focus that, that worldliness is not more a description of us than biblical Christianity. That we are walking separated unto God. As you draw near to God, you are wanting to be sanctified. That, that's that purity. That's, Lord, I want to confront compromise. I want to con confront where sin if I'm nurturing sin in any way, I am convicted by God because I love him so much and he loves me. And in that, I am being separated, transformed instead of conformed to the image and pattern of the world. Isn't that a good word for now? It's the Holy Spirit. It's not the carnal spirit. It's the Holy Spirit that wants to Purify us. And when I talk about fire, it's the very dross of sin that a holy fire just shaping us into the likeness of Christ where we walk in holiness. The next relationship is to ourselves. Romans 12, 3 says, by the grace given me, I say to every one of you, do not think of yourself more highly than you ought, but rather think of yourself with sober judgment. In the work of the Holy Spirit, we get an accurate self-assessment. This is in accordance with the faith God has distributed to each of you. It merges in with your relationship with God and the purpose he's given you. And so you don't assess yourself inaccurately. This is where the, cha the, the chains of insecurity can be broken once and for all. In the spirit of revival, the Holy Spirit is a chain breaker. And one of the chains that would love to wrap around your character and mine is insecurity. And it manifests in one of two ways. Either we're beaten down and feel like we can't do anything and we never measure up and everybody's better. Or it manifests in pride where we try to puff ourselves up and one-up everybody because the way we feel affirmed is to one-up everyone. It's ugly, it's a chain, and the Spirit of God helps us to have the right relationship with ourselves. I want you to make sure this is included, because when we talk about revival, it's not just us and God. It's how we see ourselves, and that right, sober judgment will deliver us into freedom. Freedom to be just who God has created us to be. And in this culture of comparison, that trap is broken when the Spirit of God is at work and you have sober judgment about yourself. God created you. He knew you before he formed you. He loves you. You're his. He has marked you with his character and nature. You have the DNA of God. You're made in the image of God. May I come against any kind of darkness or lie that is trying to bring you down or puff you up in the spirit of God. See yourself for who you are. The fourth relationship is to the believers around us, the church. And we're called to be devoted to one another in love. Honor one another above, our, above yourselves. You stop right there for a moment and just say, the environment, the culture of a church in revival is, is the power of the love of Jesus being experienced as we love our brothers and our sisters and we honor them. Love and honor mark the culture. Now, Lust and dishonor mark the culture of the world. And as we walk in love and walk in honor of one another, what a, just what a witness that is. Loving each other for who we are and who God has saved us to be, believing in each other, praying for one another, encouraging one another. That's the church, isn't it? And isn't that such a winsome magnetic gathering where people honor each other because see we're, we're at peace in who we are and I can celebrate your success 
I can rejoice when you rejoice and I can weep when you weep. That's right in Romans chapter 12. Praise God for the church. And so when we talk about revival, it's not just that I'm drawing near to God. I'm drawing near to my brothers and sisters. My heart has not only been changed toward God, but it's being changed toward my church. And notice it says, never be lacking in zeal. That's that fire of God. But keep your spiritual fervor. Why? Because you are ministers. You are serving. We have given glory to God as we started this service. That's where you bring your attention and you give it to God and you engage your heart. You're not like those that the Bible says they worship with their lips, but their heart was far from that experience. No. When we give glory, that's our attention, that's our heart, that's our energy, our engagement. Even in giving, that's why giving is worship, because we are giving to God. First and foremost, we're worshiping God. You continue to give glory to God as you live in your purpose, in the zeal of God, serving. The New Testament picture knows nothing about a Christian that has been added to the church who doesn't serve. We got to have just biblical teaching. And if you're serving, may it affirm you. If you're not serving, this is your great opportunity to get in growth track and start serving. And nothing I say will probably make you do that. But if the spirit of God is at work, then this relationship with you and the church is going to be adjusted. See, it's not just fervor, it's formation. Thank God for the fire, but thank God for the adjustments that we make in our lives because of the fire. Thank God for the motivation. It's fresh, but it leads to maturity where I say, God has given me a gift and I'm going to deploy that through the local church to influence people. Any church that gets this, with the let me just talk about this church. We have enough people where there shouldn't be a vacancy in any ministry. Right? The brilliant plan of God, he's just given us all gifts and talents. And because you're walking in revival and understand what it is to be a living sacrifice, you give your worship to God and you serve him. And so then whether it's kids ministry, student ministry, whatever ministry, we have so many, here's the picture, so many people that we can set up rotations and nobody has to burn out. People can serve and still be in church. We have people serving in kids' ministry that rarely get to come into this gathering because we don't have enough people. If revival is really at work, it will show up in the zeal to serve. Sign me up. Point me to the way. I am in this to make it. Come on, church. We're going to do this. We're going to be that church. We're going to be that church. Unbelievers is that fifth relationship, and it's found from verses 14 to 21. I'll just read verse 21. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. We're in the world. We don't capitulate to its standard. We have offered ourselves in a sanctifying, holy walk with God that is now combined with a deep love for people who don't know Jesus. And we overcome the evil with good, good works that cause people to turn their hearts and their focus to Jesus. Overcoming evil with good is another way of saying and and the gates of hell will not prevail against us. The church empowered, the church in freedom, just who we are is this massive witness 
and then couple it with what we do, so many people will be getting saved. I have a vision of hundreds of people in Alpha growing in their understanding and getting saved. I want to stand here and say over the last seven days, there's been many, many people. Every day, people have been being added to the church, and that's the language I'm going to use. Anybody in the New Testament that got saved, they were added to the church. They didn't sit at home, isolated, and walking it out. They were saved into a family, turned from sin to God, and they joined the team serving out of their gifts. Did, come on, you, you see the vision? See the vision? But it only activates when true revival is happening. All this potential within this church is, can be illustrated by your phone, my phone. There's so much potential. But what if I go and get this and I never activate it? Then it's just unrealized potential. There's so much potential locked up. Holy Spirit is speaking today. Make sure that you don't have potential that is locked up. Activate the potential and the gifts that God has given you. And let's be a church unlike we have ever been. Fire of God, fall fresh and activate the church. Come on, put some praise right there. Woo. That's who we are. That's who we are. Now, to every acceptable sacrifice, this is very important. There was a divine response. When the burnt offering, like when that lamb was prepared, the fire consumed it. When Elijah prepared the sacrifice, fire consumed that sacrifice. And as a result, it says that all of those standing around fell on their faces and cried out, the Lord, he is God. I want such a compelling witness coming from us, the assembly that it's causing people to be convinced that the Lord, he is God. That it breaks through the deception and through the confusion. And more than ever, you see droves of people saying, the Lord, he is God. How did you come to that conclusion? Because of the fiery witness, the power, the authenticity, the brilliance, the peace, the freedom in the witness from the church. Isaiah was in the temple on the Lord's day and he was distracted and distraught because King Uzziah had died. And he lifted his heart and the glory of God filled that place. And it ignited repentance and Isaiah cried out in genuine repentance and fire from the altar of God touched his heart. It didn't stop with just repentance, his relationship with God. It went on to include his purpose because God started asking, who's going to go to the nations with this news? And Isaiah said, here am I. Send me. He activated. He even got so bold, he said, send me to the nations. God, send us to our neighbors. Send us to the nations. Send us across the street and send us across the world. Deploy the gifts that you've deposited within this faith family and in faith let it move the kingdom of God. For Isaiah shows us when the fire falls, it ignites purpose. And there's power on that ignited purpose. When the fire falls, there's consecration. When the fire falls, watch this, we live holy. When the fire falls, we can live holy. For it's the power of God that we want to be holy, and it's the power of God that helps us to be holy. 
It's the fire of God in the upper room. It's when the 120, they offered themselves as a living sacrifice. And the fire of God set upon each of them. And that fire never went out. They devoted themselves to God. They devoted themselves to each other. They devoted themselves to the word and consecration. They devoted themselves to radical generosity and to reaching their world regardless of the cost, regardless of how intense, regardless of persecution. That is the holy, powerful fire of New Testament revival. Put up the five for me, if you will, one more time. Look at these five. God, the world, I'm consecrated, self, right assessment, believers, honor, honoring, loving, serving, unbelievers, witnessing. It's not I'm drawing near to God, but I don't make my way to the unbeliever. It's all five of them, amen? Now, I, I wanna break this down. When it comes to God, that's worship, world, self, and believers. That's discipleship, sanctification, freedom with my own identity, serving, honoring, loving the believers and the unbelievers' mission. If we will worship God, devote to radical discipleship, and if we will be on mission, that's fuel. And the fire will hit that fuel. We gotta give God something to work with something for him to consume. And this is what we offer our worship, discipleship, and to be on mission. I would say to any person, any person, pastor, just dream team member, that what I would want to do the most for you is light the fire, but I can't. I can stir it up, but I can't light it. But if we'll provide the fuel through a living sacrifice, the fire will fall. I hope this reaches to the back row. I hope this goes from one side. The fire of God, the fire of consecration, the fire of soul winning, the fire of full devotion, the fire of changing a city, the fire of changing a culture, the fire of standing strong in the Lord, the fire to put our hearts in the word and not shrink back, the fire of God that falls on a living sacrifice. Come on, just give him praise. Holy Spirit and fire, baptize us in the Holy Spirit and fire. Oh, God. Come on, let's go. Lord Jesus, we need you. John Wesley, worship team, if you will come because the whole worship team, we're about to give him glory. John Wesley, God was using him and thousands of people were getting saved and kingdom of God is advancing. And so they ask, how's this happening? And really the story is like, he's trying to find language. He says, I just seek God. And the word gets in my heart like Jeremiah said, like fire shut up in my bones. He said, all I know to tell you is I just set myself spiritually on fire and people come watch me burn. Give us a church that'll say, Lord, let your fire fall. Making sure you hear what I'm saying fire that closes the gap between the Lord and me, that separates me from compromise. 
that sets me free in who I am and sets me free from who I am not. On fire to love my brothers and sisters, be a prayer partner, lock arms and walk the valleys, trusting God and praying for one another and then serving, serving. And then knowing that our competency, it comes from the Holy Spirit. So this doesn't rest on me. I'm empowered. My competency comes from the Holy Spirit. So I'm compelled to people that don't know Jesus. And I share authentically. I share with humility. I share with clarity who Jesus is. Just so naturally supernatural. It is supernatural that you can overcome evil with good. You don't fight evil with evil, you fight it with good. That's supernatural. Supernatural. That's the fire I'm talking about. William Carey, he was burdened for countries to come to know Jesus and people were saying these people don't care about God you would be perhaps wasting your time and you, and you may lose your life but there was a fire and he took the gospel to countries that were unreached and closed he worked in translating the Bible into languages for people that didn't have the scripture he was dynamic in influencing education and social reform. And they said, William, how'd you do all this? He said, all I know to tell you is God put a fire in my heart and it helped me to persevere through the challenge of the obstacles. Oh, isn't that the early church? The persecution didn't stop them. Their limitations didn't limit them. We are here today because of the fire that fell in that upper room. Over 107 years ago, this church started. And it started with that kind of power. There was fuel and God brought the fire. And this fire still burns today, but now our stewardship is to come and offer ourselves as a living sacrifice so that the fire continues to burn and perhaps burn hotter than ever. The word zeal, never lacking in zeal, that word zeal can be translated instantly hot. Like I'm walking with God. You know the people that immediately start worshiping when worship starts? The reason they, they don't have to get into it, they've been worshiping all week. They're just doing what they've been doing. But there's this fresh thing about being together. I sense something I can't describe. I just know it's real. And you know it's real. Consumed. Consumed. And so William Carey said, as the fire burned, I just started expecting great things from God and attempting great things for God. And that has carried over the generations Expect great things from God. Attempt great things for God. Remember, that was born in the fire. Mm. It was born as a man offered himself as a living sacrifice. You know, the, the Bible says, don't, don't wax cold. The love of many is waxing cold. That waxing cold is like a kettle on a fire that got moved off the fire. 
and it grew cold. If that would be a description of you, get back on the fire by being a living sacrifice. If you say, I'm on fire, then I need you to stay on fire because nothing less is gonna turn this culture back to God. I'm telling you, the devil is fighting with fire. The fire of distraction, the fire of lust, the fire of identity confusion, the fire of addiction. He's fighting with fire and we need to fight with fire. There are times that you fight fire with fire. I'm preaching the greater fire. I'm preaching the holy fire. I'm preaching the sanctified, sacred fire of God that's greater than the fire of this world. Come on, church. Come on, 